Hello everyone, it's Rackman John here. Um, I have come back with a chair, an actual chair for me to rest my vile form upon, and uh, we're going to be listening to some music today. It, um, this is the music that my uh, valued subscriber Ian Neal has sent me. Um, it is a collection of albums. We'll be listening to a couple of them over the course of the next few weeks, but this one in particular that I've never heard before. It's disc two of the Forest Hill Clubhouse. And it has uh, Irvin Nerejihazi, or Nerejihazi, it depends how you want to say how there's different schools of thought. Um, in fact, I remember there was a poster that said, uh, from, from his uh, younger days, I think he may, maybe he might have been 17, um, with his debut at Carnegie Hall in uh, the 1920s, it said, pronounced as written, so that there's various debates over how it's actually actually said. But yes, the uh, Forest Hill Clubhouse Disc 2, you'll be able to listen along now, and uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to very much enjoy this. Uh, so my thanks once more to Ian Neal for his valued contribution to this channel. I, you know, never in a hundred years would have expected to receive such a generous gift. Might move a little bit closer. Just get everything correct. And we're good to go. Beginning now. This is a piece by Franz Liszt. So it's or Sapris from the uh, Years of Pilgrimage, can't remember which book. Uh, number three, I think. already creating that immense sense of scale that we all know and love. Yeah, this is uh, bass control. It's definitely right here in that recording. It's uh change of texture. The stark octaves. Very, very listian. Mm. A contrasting section. He's got a very special way about making the um the flourishes, the uh, flourishing arpeggios, uh, even when they're contained within a single octave, giving them a certain mass, shape, and definition that's it's very pleasing.
really um, slowly makes the melody sweeter and sweeter and uh, gives this immense sigh of relief because most most pianists I find won't go that far um, into transforming a melody into a narrative. So now we're we're in one of those you know sweeter. Sorry, I had a terrible sleep last night, don't worry. Still got my full attention, whatever that means. Yes, very languid. As usual, great attention to the internal voices. Very, um, gives it a massive feeling. Even when there's not large amounts of sonority, just the, um, the amount of, um, effect that you can bring out with a limited number of voices uh, in a single mildly polyphonic section if you know how to play it correctly it's quite staggering really What I find um, a lot of people miss about uh, Nridjaz's uh, phrasing uh, is that, you know, a lot of the time it has has a constant um, baseline volume, so the, the, the volume of the phrase doesn't change over its course, but it does lead to a certain, how should I say, contouring of the phrase that's really attractive to me. So it, it has a, you know, a will to it, a determination that doesn't, um, how should I say, it doesn't allow your attention to go. It, it holds you in place, almost pin, pins you to the ground and um, then, then rips you back up and takes you places. It's, you know, it's very bold. Uh, a, a uncompromising way of playing. Um, not many people do it at all. But yes, the uh, contrast is between sections rather than within the phrase itself. Uh, not to say there isn't contrast inside phrases, but it doesn't always uh, make use of that. That really adds to the um, sense of complete musical conviction that I, uh, I get from his playing. See, his octaves are far more uh, lyrical in this section, even though they've got that same, you know, displaced from reality feel. So now I've got some tremolos and some uh, bass melody. Part 
does remind me a little bit of uh, Valer Dobman. And also some of his original compositions, if you've heard any of those, they're yeah, quite nice. Very uh, single-minded without being overly monotonous. So yeah, in this and in uh, March of the Three Holy Kings, it's got a very different uh, conception of staccato to most of us. You know, it's a, it's 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 short, but it's also very very stocky, very stout, uh, you know, fat staccato, so to speak, uh, like a, like an elephant's uh, footstep. I don't mind. It's a um, mm. it carries an ooh, <laughs> bass there. It carries a sense of mass with it. That's uh, how should I say? It's very difficult to offer commentary playing like this because it forces you to analyze. And once you start analyzing, you could sometimes miss some of the uh, meaning behind it. Or it's funny how that happens. Tritone. It's quite Dante-esque, this piece. It's a little more... How should I say? A little more single-minded. Which is why it's such a good fit, probably. Pardon my uh, neck cracks. Back to the lyrical section. I want to see what he does with the uh, melody here. Mm, the part that was so beautiful. It's uh, like a moment uh, suspended in time. I, I, I really am. Um, fail to encapsulate it in words.
little section there. So, uh, I've heard a couple of people say that, um, even people who aren't always a big fan of his playing, that uh, in most uh, Nujihazi recordings there's a uh, moment where you can say uh, of, of, of absolute clarity or some even say truth. I think that's, that's probably it for this recording. Although, I, I think I appreciate the rest of his playing a lot more than they do. It's just, um... An epiphany of sorts, when it all comes together. And, um... Makes everything right. Takes you away. This part two, it's very nice. the end of that one. Track just finished. Well, what a, what an amazing experience that was. I, I challenge you to find a pianist who can, you know, craft a narrative quite like that. It's, it's, it's incredible. It really is. Um, I mean, it's, you can always rely on uh, recording by him to, to really <laughs> humble, uh, one's skill as an artist. I'm going to... Alright, the second one is... Uh, Christus. So track two from disc two. Okay. Alright, so... And beginning... Now. So, Weihnacht. Oratium. I think Oratium... I'm just waiting for the uh, text to scroll past on my computer. This is 22 tw or 23 minutes long. Obviously. So some people said that um, I haven't actually listened to the whole thing, at least not the original. That uh, this um, right here by list the uh, Christus as possibly his best composition um, which I find it difficult to believe maybe they just weren't a big fan of his uh, sonata or something but you know I... certainly this I haven't heard before I'm not sure if it's on YouTube or not but it, at least I didn't come across it I've listened to most of the stuff on YouTube, if not all. Also, let me know if you want me to uh, react to the less obscure pieces that I have heard before. Um, I think I'll be able to offer a more, well, more enthusiastic uh, reaction. At the moment, I am a little sick. I. Uh, gum infection actually. I uh, didn't kiss a frog. I just wisdom teeth got removed a little while ago. So back here got a little inflamed. But apart from that, farting on. Yes, this is a lot more early list uh, at least in the harmony wise than what I believe the last one was. Oh my. Hmm. Really, really flagging here. Yeah, I probably should have put it off. I just couldn't wait to listen to it with you guys. Really, I couldn't.
Sounds almost like a, um, a cradle song of sorts. Very uh, innocent harmonies. Great control of sonority, really. I am. Um How he times all those um, big rolled chords so that they they uh, lap over each other. It's just great. Certainly is very, uh, very Christmassy. If I had this at Christmas time and I checked it out, I uh, would have listened to it for that. But uh, Gorgeous alto melody there. Gorgeously phrased as well. Might be getting a bit more lively. different layers and sound that it makes from the bass rumble to the uh, middle melody to the um, little, uh, I think it'd be a flute call. Da, 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 da. Yeah, it's really uh, transcending the um, percussive nature of the piano into the orchestral nature, which is, I suppose, how Liszt, Liszt saw it as a um, this sort of a symphonic device rather than a percussive one. Well, I suppose there's definitely room for both.
glorious, uh, restrained, yet still thunderous space tone. It's, it's classic, it really is. <laughs> yeah. Frankly, um, I, I really don't know how he does it. Um, I really don't. <laughs> it's just uh, that, that kind of tone quality. I could literally say it's unheard of. I haven't heard anyone else do it. Certainly not. Yeah. Very difficult to emulate. And emulate consistently. So, to do it, you have to understand how the rest of the strings resonate in sympathy. Especially if you've got repeated notes in there, you've got to phrase those differently. And, oh, it's just... Yeah, one needs to have a very intuitive grasp of overtone harmonics to be able to attempt to do that. I, I don't have that. I'll try to cultivate it. I'm not sure if I ever will. beautiful uh, churchy harmonies here. Yeah. Given a, um, a new depth, new uh, gravity. The, um, the mass of the chords is manipulated over the course of the phrase I find very fascinating yeah. a little little um, more sprightly section see here, here the staccato like before the staccato was much much fatter here it's a little more um, scherzando a little more uh, a little more trivial, I should suppose I should say, which is a nice, uh, nice break. Still a very orchestral staccato. It's not the um, the uh, machine gun staccato of some piano performers, which has its place, I suppose. But you won't hear it here. sounding chord progression. Less so here, it's spiraled away from being forward looking, but it's interesting how uh, how modern list was even as a younger man. 
his uh, apparitions, I believe they were. Yeah, apparitions are uh, written in his twenties, but they're incredibly. Incredibly uh, modern harmonically, even more than uh, Schubert's uh, Lieder. Great balance between the um, high chords and the melody below. So even in these simple moments, there's still something very special going on. build up a bit of heaviness again. Very interesting use of the sustain pedal. Strong pulse. than I'll be used to, I'll be expecting. Quite fleeting, I'm expecting them to come back. Dying away now. I have a feeling we'll be getting a real climax before the end. shaped very nicely. Just gonna cross my legs. Uh -oh. Some very uh, 
gorgeous uh, seeing turn in here. And again, yes, gonna combine singing tone, I think, with the um, bass rumble. And you have this underpinning of um, low bass that acts as a buffer for everything above it, elevating it. It's very beautiful. Even, even though it's harmonically very simple, you can get a lot of depth out of the chords. Just need to know how. Amazing clarity. Amazing clarity. Now he's uh, desynced the hands. Gives it gives it more depth. I think. It's a brave choice. Very brave choice. It works. Sincerely think it does. Building up. Yeah, left hand. Get a uh, pedal point. dirt in that chord there, but that'll be resolved. Tardando, so good. Releasing the tension. Whew. It's extraordinarily beautiful, that one. Wow. That's the end of that. Well. Oh. to sit for a minute in that yeah extraordinary very extraordinary my thanks again to um ian for sending this to me i uh, don't think that is on the internet at all i uh, would never have heard it uh until i had bought these uh discs for myself oh well i very much appreciate you tuning in uh it's been great listening to this music with you and i will see you in the next one thank you very much